Talmor, Sheshin Mugachi. Talmor is my home. My family have worked the land for generations. My gran says the island does not belong to us, but we belong to the island. And we must be ready for a great evil is coming. And death follows with it. Listen and subscribe to the latest season of Undertow, The Harrowing, a story glass production presented by Realm, available wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, I'm Alexis Ohanian. You may know me as one of the co-founders of Reddit, but more recently, a large part of my identity is being a father to my wonderful daughters. In my podcast, Business Dad, I hope to open the conversation about working parents a bit. You'll get to hear from a wide range of business dads, from Rain Wilson and Guy Raz to Todd Carmichael and Shane Battier, to find out how they balance being a dad with a successful career. Business Dad is available now, so be sure to listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Hello, world, and welcome back to another episode of Thanks for Coming In. I'm your host, Jillian Clare. How was your week? I am feeling very um, unmotivated the last couple of days. Like today I went to put on just like a movie um, to have in the background while I was working on school and some other stuff. And I put on The Princess Diaries and like that was it. I was, I don't know why I did that to myself because I should know that that's a very bad idea. I put it on and I watched the whole dang thing. And at this point, you know, I'm one movie in. I've abandoned all hope of getting anything of importance done for the day. So I'm just like, you know what? Let's just dive right in. Let's let's go to the sequel, which I did. Um, and and you know, I cried, uh, especially at the part when oh, she brings all all little orphan children on the the Genovia parade with her. Oh my god. Um, and then then after that, I was like, wow, um, should we just continue to dive into my my teen years? Like, should we just do this? Is this an all day marathon? And um I convinced myself to do that. So then I watched Confessions of a Teenage Drama Queen, <laughs> which I realized is a very problematic film. Um I haven't watched it in a few years. I love that movie. I loved it growing up too. I thought it was like the best teen movie um but everyone acts pretty chill about the fact that this like rocker musician star um is casually like dancing and hanging out with a 15 year old girl which for like I don't know I was probably 10 or 11 when I first saw that movie when it came out um I can't remember what year it was but I'm guessing I was around that age and thinking back on that you know, that's a pretty impressionable age. And it's no wonder that, um, because I loved that movie. I watched it all the time. It's no wonder that I've always dated like older musicians, not older than like, you know, grandpa age, but like older than me musicians. Anyway, I'm now blaming Disney for that too. I know we all blame Disney for, you know, expecting us to be like princesses when we grow up, but now this is an added uh, facet into... (laughs) into my relationship status. Um, so yeah, I watched that and then I, I put on the Lizzie McGuire movie, um, which is also about a, you know, shithead musician. Um, that's, it's, it was a theme in the, you know, like 2000s. Anyway, that was my day. Um, and now I'm here about to talk with Christy and I'm pretty excited. Uh, today on the show, we have Christy Ferris, You may remember her from Passions, the NBC soap opera that was on for several years. She played Simone on that. She was also on Scrubs. Um, She's been in a thousand million different things. Right now, you can see her on this series called Monogamy, which is a part of the All Black Network on Amazon Prime. She plays Deandra. um, And she's recently gotten into producing and directing and all this other stuff. So uh, here is my conversation with Christy. And welcome to the show, Miss Christy Ferris. Yay, thank you for having me. 
Thank you for coming on. I'm so excited to talk to you. Um, I feel like I know a lot of the same people that you know. Um, I grew up on Days of Our Lives, and I know that you spent many years on Passions, and there's a lot of crossover there. Um, yes. But how was it? Because I remember Passions being so absolutely wild. Um, I have to ask, like, how was that show? <laughs> Oh, I mean, it was cuckoo. I mean, it yeah. literally was like, wait, what is happening? And when I jumped in on the show, you know, I replaced another actress. Uh, and so when I, so they had to make a fast decision um, because they waited for a little while. And then I had booked a pilot and a TV oh. show. I mean, and a, a commercial so it forced them to have to make a decision like quickly are they going to use me or not mm. and so because that happened they i think they might have been waiting until the end of the storyline <laughs> but because of that situation they had to throw me in so i remember getting booked on Remember getting the job on a Tuesday. I went in for a fitting on Wednesday and I had four scripts to memorize and do on Thursday and jump in and do the show. And they were all paragraphs of just straight monologue. Oh my God. When Kay was jumping into the fire in the closet. And I oh remember my God. thinking, oh my God, I'm going to, oh my God, what am I, wait, what is this? Like, what do you mean she's jumping into the fire? Who is she? Why would she do that? So I'm like so lost. <laughs> Right. And, and um, I mean, I was kind of familiar because my girlfriends watched the show. They were they loved passions. And I never watched it because um, I was mad at them because I tried to get in to audition for Whitney. Oh, my and God. Six people call on my behalf and they would not see me. What? And I have no idea why. No. I was like, why won't they see me? Um, and That's so when so they called strange. me, I know. Uh, and so two years later, they called me in for Simone. And um, and I remember I remember when I had the audition and, and leaving the room, I just remember everybody like, oh, my God, that was incredible. You know, it was oh. it was nice to have. It was actually Lindsay, um, Teresa, the character, yeah. Teresa and uh, Brooke Kerr, who um, played my sister Whitney, and, and Julian, uh, oh, Ben. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they all, I came out of the audition and I remember them just looking at me and going, that was incredible. And I remember Ben saying, if you don't book this, you're gonna, you're gonna work. I was like, oh my God, it was so you're nice. Like, oh my God, well, especially for like an actor to hear that, it's just one of those things where you're like, oh, thank God I'm doing something right. <laughs> Yeah, because when I had an audition, I actually messed up in the audition before we started doing the actual taping um, for the test. I had messed up. I actually had messed up in all three of the auditions. <laughs> um, and so uh, even gotten a little bit of an argument with, uh, with the casting director. But um, yeah, I remember like, I think if they hadn't have said that, I probably would have worried for a long time. Um, mm. afterwards, like it been in my head about it. But when they said that to me, which was so sweet, cause you know, not a lot of young people do that. They don't support one another, but they, they're, they're good people and they do yeah. and they did, you know? So. Well, I think, I think that's one of the good things about, um, especially the soap opera community. It feels very supportive. It doesn't have that like toxic, um, hierarchy that I feel like a lot of different shows do. I was I was talking about this with somebody recently where we were talking about how like when you're a co-star or a guest star coming on to a, t a television series for the week, sometimes there is that weird hierarchy within it where people make you feel less than. And oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. it's it's not a fun situation to be a part of, but I feel like on soap operas, it's like theater almost just everyone's so loving because you have to be with each other so much <laughs> and all the time. <laughs> there is no stopping. Yeah, I totally agree. I've, I've definitely been on a couple of shows that, um, I mean, it was very rare, but like I had one situation where the lead actress, uh, I don't know what the word would be, but she was insecure about what I had on and made me change. You know what I mean? Made me change. Oh, my man. Um, 
um, which didn't fit the character. Like they were like, no matter, I mean, the, I remember wardrobe was like, no matter whatever we put you in, you're still going to be beautiful. Like, what are we supposed to do? Right. Um, like wearing a cardigan isn't going to help the situation. <laughs> exactly. Um, and, you know, I had another situation where another actress uh, tried to tell me how I should do the line, do the words. Uh... And so, um, and it was a very interesting dynamic because, you know, I've also been in a situation where I did try, I did change it up. Because yeah. I was like, oh, well, they must know the writer told me to change it up. So, I, I, you know, let me change it. Well, what ended up happening on that situation, um, it wasn't what I did in the audition. And everybody's like looking at me like she's not a good actress. And it messed up my reoccurring because I'm sure I would have had a reoccurring on it. Oh, but because yeah. I was doing it the way that the writer and um, it was a medical show and the 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 person who comes on the show to tell you how to say the words right and how to do the medical procedures and all that. And she's like, oh, you know, the person would never get, a doctor would never get that, you know, upset. And so I was like, oh, okay. So I wasn't doing it. And by the time we got to like the ninth take, I'm like, what is going on? Like, what is, and then finally the director told me and I'm like, you know, of course I did it, but by that time it wasn't good because I should have did that in the very beginning. So I learned, don't let someone else tell you how to do the character, let the director. Mm -hmm. So by the time I got to this show and the actress was like, yeah, don't, don't be funny. Don't say it like that, <laughs> which was a dramedy. It was like, you know, <laughs> and I just basically told her, I was like, you know what? Um, this is what I did in the audition. The producer came up to me and gave, and thanked me for what I did in my audition. He was like, oh my God, you were so brilliant. I, literally, that is what happened. So she argued with me. And then finally, I was like, you know what? Why don't you just tell the director and let the director tell me? There and, you go. And, yeah, but everybody in the room, like hair and makeup, they all got quiet. And I could tell they all <laughs> like, did she really? And I was dead serious. And sure enough, I did it exactly the way that I did. And finally, I, I saw her go over and have a conversation with the director. So the director, you know, came and told me what to do. And I did it. And I was like, okay, cool. Yeah, I could do that. But you know which take did they use? The funny one. Of course they did. Yeah. Of course they did. Because if you go in, you've already built this character. You've already made the choices. You've already made the decisions of how you're going to play things. Mm -hmm. So, And that's what got you on the set. I mean, that's, yes. that's, that's our what number one here. job as an actor is to make these choices. And if mm -hmm. you make it to that set, that means they liked your choices. End of yeah. story. Yeah. And listen, you know, she, basi she basically cussed me out too. I'll never forget. Ooh. She was like, I saw her, saw her later. We were at an event. And she like pulled me to the side and was like, you know, no, actually, I think she did it on set. She was like, you know, I'm the star of this show. Like, you know, they listen to what I say. And I was like, and I still was adamant. I was like, okay, great. Please tell the director and then have the director tell me, mm -hmm. period. You know, because I'm at this point, I'm grown. You know what I mean? Like, I'm a grown woman. Right. I, and I've been in this business a long time. I'm not a young actor who doesn't know anything. And I stood my ground. I was like, yeah, no, and you're not going good to for you do. for doing that. Because there are a lot of, of actors, especially young actors who just come out here from college or maybe they didn't even go to college and they would get on set and be intimidated by that and say, yeah. oh, maybe I should do what this person is telling me. But that's one of my biggest like beefs with, with, um, with how things work on set sometimes. It's just like, no actor should be telling another actor how to do a certain line, period, yeah. ever. It's not our jobs. If you want to, like, discuss the character with me and you want to get, like, deep and you want to, like, get into things, love that. Let's yeah. do it. Do not tell me how to say my line. Just don't Yeah, do and, and again, there's always exceptions to the rule. You know what I mean? There's a difference when – you know, you're young and maybe you're new and you, you, and you also have to look at people's intentions. Like some people will do that mess to mess you up, but some people are doing it because, um, they're really trying to help you. There have been times mm -hmm. when I've said, Hey, you might want to blah, 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 because I know the whole thing, but I, 
I'm, I, I know my craft and I knew that what she was giving me was not the right choice. Um, but listen, if James Kahn told me to, you know, do something different and was like, Hey, yeah. do this. I probably would listen to James Kahn. You know yeah, what I mean? No, I mean, yeah. Like there, there's exceptions. If like yeah, this you know I mean? was on set with me and he was like, you need to do it this way. I'd be like, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I will do it this way. What do you need? What do you need? <laughs> Got you. Yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, there are exceptions to the rule. But, you know, you have to trust your instinct. And I think that's what it is. And and sometimes, you know, what I might do is do it the way that I did it and then maybe do it the second choice that somebody else might have said. You know, there's yeah. there's always that, you know, because I don't want to I don't want to tell an actor to um, to like, hey, don't listen to them. You know, what I mean, but mm-hmm. Billy Bob Thornton is the lead on the show that I was on Goliath. And if he told me how to do something. I probably would change that mess up, but maybe I just didn't respect yeah. this actress. And I, I think also too, I was like, this actress is not, she's not good. So that does little- change things a bit, but you know I, mean, I mean, yeah. Like if you're with these A-listers, it's, you know, it, it, it's something that I've um, spoken with my, my friends with a lot. It's like, you know, you see these actors who have uh, worked with big names over the years and their progression and how much better they get over the years. And like, yeah, well, when you're working with Brad Pitt and Leonardo DiCaprio and all those people and you're learning from them, you're going to get better to the point where you are that caliber of acting. So if you're working with that, you know, big name, that A-list or that Hollywood Walk of Fame person, I mean, yeah, you like soak it all in got to be a sponge. Right. Um, but I do want to talk to you a bit about your training because you um, got a BFA in theater from Emerson. Mm-hmm. Is that right? I mean, that's yes. that's quite the the program. Yeah. Quite the rigorous thing to go through. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was a four-year program. I remember, um, you know, I got into a couple of different schools, but when I had the audition for Emerson, um they told me right on the spot in my audition that they wanted me and what, what did they have to do to get me there? So I knew before I left the audition that I was going to go to Emerson. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it had, it, it, it had its ups and downs, which I'm sure a lot of schools do. Um, but I had Kristen Linklater who, um, Mm. is, you know, freeing the natural voice. I had her as a freshman, and that was such a blessing. Um, I learned so much from her and it set me on the trajectory of being confident as a woman of color um, mm-hmm. in this business. And she, she really helped me and gave me confidence and um, as an 18 year old. Um, and then LA had a program here in, I'm sorry, Emerson had a program here in LA. And instead of me uh, staying only one semester, I was like, I had already told the head of the department, like, I'm not coming back. So we <laughs> out how I can stay in LA. And he's like, oh, that's never been done. And I was like, yeah, I know, but that's what's going to happen. But can it be done? That's the yeah, question. Exactly. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but I'm not exaggerating at the same time. I wasn't, I really wasn't like, hey, you're going to have to make this work. But I was like, Yeah, I know it's never happened, but if it could be done, what do I need to have in order to graduate? And so he was like, gave me a look. He's like, well, you need to take such and such, but we can substitute this for this. And I was like, okay. Yeah, so I came to L.A. um, and did an L.A. program. I had this guy named Brad Lamack who taught me the business of acting, and he helped me. I mean, the wisdom that he gave me, uh, I booked seven shows in six months, you know? Wow. Yeah. When I graduated, it was like, I booked my first show before I graduated. Um, It's the day that I got back from LA. I'm sorry, back from Boston from graduating. I tested for Young and the Restless. Didn't get it. Tested with Shamar Moore. Um, And I think the only reason why I got scared. Yeah. I got scared because my girlfriend was like, Oh my God. I know. Um, she was like, Oh my God. Oh my God. Her life is going to change. And when she said that, it was like, Oh my God. Oh my God. She's right. And I freaked out. I didn't really freak out, but I just wasn't my best. Um, 
But then I ended up booking, you know, six more shows after that. And I was just on fire. You can shop from anywhere doing pretty much anything. You might shop while working, eating, or even listening to this podcast. And however you shop, we all know and love the thrill of the hunt. But do you also know how to get the thrill of the best deals? Because Rakuten shoppers do. With Rakuten, they get the deals they love with the most savings and cash back. And you can get it too. Start getting cash back at your favorite stores like Sephora, Nike, and even Expedia if you're looking to get some travel in. And getting cash back doesn't mean you have to miss out on sales because those can just be stacked right on top. It's easy to use and based on a simple idea. Stores pay Rakuten for sending them shoppers, and Rakuten shares the money with you as cash back through PayPal or check. Download the free Rakuten app and never miss a deal. Or go to Rakuten.com to start getting the most bang for your buck. That's R-A-K-U-T-E-N. As a podcast network, our first priority has always been audio and the stories we're able to share with you. But we also sell merch, and organizing that was made both possible and easy with Shopify. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell and grow at every stage of your business, from the launch your online shop stage all the way to the did we just hit a million orders stage. Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell everywhere. They have an all-in-one e-commerce platform and in-person POS system, so wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. With the internet's best converting checkout, 36% better on average compared to other leading commerce platforms, Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers. Shopify has allowed us to share something tangible with the podcast community we've built here, selling our beanies, sweatshirts, and mugs to fans of our shows without taking up too much time from all the other work we do to bring you even more great content. And it's not just us. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. Shopify is also the global force behind Allbirds, Rothy's, and Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Because businesses that grow grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash realm, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash R-E-A-L-M now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash realm. Yeah. So you stayed in LA and then it just kind of... It just it became that thing where you just got on that roll. Yeah, because you know what I you know what it was is that being here for that year, I didn't have to worry about paying rent. I didn't have to mm. worry about paying bills. The only thing I had to worry about was eating, gas, and paying my phone bill because phones was it was like the year that cell phones came out and they were like cheap. Was it like the Nokia, the block it was one? Like little- well, no, it was like right after that. So you, you had that. Yeah. And then the next year when I graduated or that year that I was 97, they had the little flip and you yep. it was like, don't call me after, you know, call me after nine, call me on the weekend. <laughs> call me after nine. Yes. You know, yeah, Unlimited. Like, Kids well, like, don't understand. Yeah. Like, you know, it was like that whole thing, but like, um, don't text me. It will cost me 10 cents. I do not want that. <laughs> Well, wait, text didn't even exist back then. So that's, yeah, you know what I mean? So it was, um, it was like, I only had to worry about three things. And so my goal, what I would do was um, I would set a goal when I had an audition because an agent found me and um, it was, I mean, like I had the best story. And so instead of me worrying about booking the job, I would set goals when I go into an audition. So if I mess up, do I have the courage to start again? That would be my goal for an audition. Mm. The other goal would be, you know, I want to strike a conversation with a casting director. Um, I want to do something big and bold in the audition that's, you know, something completely different. I want to go dressed in character in a whole big, huge, you know, 18, 1800 piece. Like I would set these goals to see if they worked and how did I feel. And at that time, because I was still in school, I didn't want to really book a job. Right. Because I, you know, I only had like 
two months left. You know what I mean? Hmm. So, um, so it, I just set these goals. And then by the time I graduated, I was fearless and I was able to just go in there and nail the auditions. That is such an interesting strategy. I have never heard someone say that before. I mean, yeah. I, I got used to auditioning when I was a kid. So I, I never had that like adult fear of going yeah. into a room, which I know is very real. Um, so I was already comfortable. But hearing this, I think this is a brilliant way for people who are who still have that anxiety or who are just starting out to try and see what works for them. Because yeah, I mean, it's those are great goals. Setting a goal is is such a great idea instead of focusing so much on like booking a job. Set a goal. Yeah, it was it was about you know, it's like when you're when you're not focused on the lines and trying to get it and trying to do all this and you're focused on something else, it, it takes your mind out of it. Now you're having fun because it's like, mm-hmm. oh, okay, let me see if I can, you know, achieve this goal. Can I achieve this goal of making people laugh? Like when I auditioned for Scrubs, my goal, I actually did like stick figures on a piece of paper and was like, okay, my goal is to make the producers say, oh my God, that was amazing. You know what I mean? Great job. Mm. And Zach Graff laughing and like, you know, everybody <laughs> I, I like drew this out. And that's exactly what happened. And I'll never forget because uh, Bill Lawrence, who was the you know creator and executive producer of Scrubs, I remember walking into the, the room and him saying, this is the last call because I think I had three. Um, I remember him saying, if I don't laugh, please don't take it personal. I hate the script. It's not funny. Wow. And she, right. And so I was like, you know, and now I'm looking at my little thing because it was on the back of my little audition thing. And I'm like, okay, that might not, that goal might not work today. Um, but literally as soon as I started the very first thing, uh, the episode, for those of you guys who have seen Scrubs, I actually walked down the stairs. You know, I act like I'm walking down the stairs, but I'm really not, you know, I like yeah. walking the chair. And so um, he laughed out loud. And then he laughed again. And right before I walked out the door, he was like, you are really funny. So he said exactly what I wrote on my piece of paper. So I, I'm like a, I'm like a, this person. Manifesting. I manifest everything. There were times when I would call my, you know, I remember calling my agent and going, Hey, just so you know, I'm going to book this role. And sure enough, they would call and they would go, how did, how did you do that? Like, how did you know you were going to book it? Because I was like, I just knew I was, I was in the zone. And I will never forget, I had this one commercial that I knew I was going to book it. As soon as I left, I called my agent. Um, then two minutes later, my agent called and said, hey, they put you on hold or avail. And then like a whole month passed. And I was like, what, what happened? happened? What is going on? And they're like, oh, you're still on hold. And another couple of weeks pass. And I'm like, what happened? And then finally they were like, oh, you know what? You didn't get it. And I was like, yo, you don't understand. Like, this is weird for me. Like, I always can tell you when I'm going to book it. And then uh, two weeks after that, three weeks after that, um, it, it could have been a month, I get a phone call on a Saturday. And I don't even know how I even, because I never put my home number, but they called me at home and was like, uh, we lost the girl that we picked. Can you come do this role? And, and I ended up booking it. But the funny thing about it, I was, I just booked the script. I mean, this movie. And as I was reading it, the very first line that my character says is I want more money than Chase Bank. And that's when the telephone rang and the commercial was for Chase Bank. Stop. I'm out. <laughs> I'm tapping out. How? Yeah. Yeah. I'm telling you, it's like, that you know, is so I, weird. Oh, yeah. I, again, I, I set these goals. Like I'll say, okay, by November, I'm going to book a commercial, a film and uh, a television show. And that actually was the same year that I booked the Chase Bank and that film. Um, and so I, I just, put that energy out there. And listen, you know, for all of the actors that are out there, um, there is no right answer. You know, people are going to tell you what to do, how to do it, do it this way, do it that way. I teach a business of acting class and my goal 
um, that I do it for is for you to learn how to trust your instinct and how to market yourself. I don't let anybody stay with me longer than two months because mm. I think it's waste of money. I don't need the money. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm like, no, this is for you to get the tools and then you need to go and do what you do because I'm an actor. I don't have time to be doing all this right. extra. Um, but I think it's important for actors to set goals and, um, and, and, and do what you do. Like you have to trust your gut. You have to trust your instinct. Oh, there is one more thing I want to say this. Oh yeah. For actors. Don't compare yourself. Like things might be a little bit different now because you're not going into audition. You know what I mean? As much now, you know, everything is self tapes. Mm -hmm. But back in the day, you know, we would always have to go in and and you would see people from that you see on TV. And so at that time, rough. oh, my God. Yeah, because you're like, oh, my God, so that's, that's Tatiana Ali. I'm just throwing out names. Um, but, and you hear them, too. You hear them in the room. Do we, I've actually I've spoken yes. to so many actors who have never been in a physical audition room. And I'm like. You don't know like the half of the like competitive craziness that is out here because when you are in that waiting room and you hear yes. people doing their thing and you're just like, oh my God, it's, it's when you get into your head. Or, or if let's say for instance, you don't hear them in, in the audition room, but you already know how they would sound because yeah. you've seen <laughs> all of their work because they're series regulars on different shows, right? Yes. So I'll never forget a friend of mine got me on this audition for the George Lopez show. He was an, he was a PA on the show. So he got the script and I was like, Hey, get me in. So he got me in. And, um, and of course I was nervous because when I got there, I saw all of these actors that I knew from different TV shows and I wasn't a series regular yet at the time. Mm -hmm. So I remember thinking, oh my God, okay, but now I can't mess it up because my friend got me this and he's going to look bad. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I ended up going in, I did my thing. Later, um, I ended up not getting it. It was ironic because there were like nine black girls who auditioned and there was one white girl and she... And the white girl was the one that ended up getting it. And it was <laughs> not because any of it was the only reason why she stood out was because she made a different choice because her background was different from ours. So uh -huh. she made a different choice, which is why they liked what she did, because it was very different from what everybody else did mm. culturally. So um, but he let me see the audition tape. And all those girls that I was so like, oh, my God, they're going to do better than me. None of them had good auditions because, you know, because I was able to see it. And what I realized is that you're never competing against another actor. You're competing against yourself. And can you do what you practice at home? Did you were you able to do that in the audition room? Mm -hmm. And so. People can have bad days. Maybe they came from set and they weren't able to memorize their lines. Maybe they just, you know, something happened at home and they weren't able to do the work or whatever. Maybe they got nervous. Maybe they're nervous because you're a new person in the room. But it made me realize that I can't get worried about anybody else. All I can do is worry about myself. And can I do what I prepared myself to do? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's very true. And it's like, if I do flub, can I recover? Can I tell myself mm -hmm. it's okay? I'm human. I can keep going or I can ask to start again. Yes. Um, but I, I do think it's, it's very interesting to me how the industry has, um, you know, evolved into this self tape era where even casting directors now are like, I'm not going to go back to having a regular office. And I'm like, please, God, let me be in a regular office. I hate self tapes. Um, oh, I love self tapes. See, I, I want to be in the room. I want to be connecting. I want to have that relationship because that's like, that's, that's, you know, half of the, the work right there is creating those good relationships with casting directors. And how do you do that on self tape? Yeah. And so, and not that I don't disagree with you because I, I do agree, but I have had so many auditions where the casting director would get a phone call in the middle of the yeah. audition yeah. where no, I get that. 
You know what I mean? Like the casting director would sabotage the audition. I've had that happen. Maybe, maybe um, we can come up with like a good and a bad list of like, here's the casting yeah. directors we want to come back to like good sessions. And then here's the casting directors that can stay on self tape. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, I, I just book off. I, I think in 2014, when I started auditioning in Atlanta, because I moved to Atlanta for a little while, that's when self tape started to become really easy and popular for me. And I yeah. always booked off of my self tapes. And it is a skill, mm-hmm. but there is something about being able to have that control and being able to use the frame for when I'm really saying something that I really need to say. Mm. Yeah. But you can do that in the audition room. And part of it is even though the people in the room can see what it is, maybe the person who has to look at the self tape later might not be able to see it. Mm. So, um, so that way I like to be able to control because you can't get that close to the camera when you're no. in the room. Can you imagine getting that close to the camera if you're in the room? You're like, excuse me, let me just step over all of your things. Hello. Yeah. 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 Um, I want to talk a little bit about the show that you're on monogamy, which is on um, Amazon Prime. And it's a part of the all black network, which is amazing. I've had some other people from other shows. um, Tell me a little bit about it. The third season is out now, right? Yes. Yes. Um, Yeah. So uh, monogamy is a labor of love, man. I mean, it's it's so incredible. It's Um, it's about four couples who are going through marital issues and decide to do a spousal swap and you watch, yeah. And you watch my character go from one person to another person by the time we get to that third season. It is incredible. It's probably my best work thus far. And I've had some, I've had some good moments, um, it's one of my favorite pieces that I've done, as well as a movie called Steps of Faith, which is a faith-based mm-hmm. movie. And that um, that's had over 20 million views. <laughs> I mean, faith-based people- movies are huge. They do oh my gosh. really yeah. well. Yeah. Listen, I filmed that in 2015. They just aired it at Joel Osteen's church like two or three months ago. Yeah. They, they love they, it. They stick around for years to come. My gosh. I was like, I had no idea. But yeah, it's, it's, those two are probably, you know, my top favorite drama production mm. that I did. Yeah. And you recently got into directing. Is that right? Yes. Did I see yes. that on your Instagram? Winning you awards and being it. a badass? Yes. Um, I was like, ah, uh, yeah, no, I, during COVID, I was asked by a friend of mine named Michael, and he was doing this web series. He asked me to direct one of the episodes. I was like, ah, maybe you should get one of my friends. And he was like, yeah, no, I want you to direct. And I was like, okay, 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 fine. Now, how are we going to do this? It's COVID. Oh, you're going to have to direct over Zoom. Oh, wow. Okay. How do I do that? But all right, I could do this. I could do this challenge. We'll get their friends, their people that they trust or their husband. They can use, do the camera. Okay, great. Oh, by the way, your two actresses are deaf and they're never going to be able to be in the same room at the same time because they're going to have to be at their own house. And we have to make it look like they're actually in the same location at the same time. (gasps) And you have to be able to, to learn how to communicate with them because, you know, you don't know ASL. Right. And you're over Zoom. And you're over Zoom. So how do you communicate with an actress who's deaf and you're trying to show like, no, uh, you know, you're, you're trying to show expressions wow. of what it is that you need from them. And it was the most rewarding, you know. How, how did you do it? Did you have an interpreter? Did you learn ASL? I mean, how was it communicated? We did have, um, thank God for Google Meets. Google Meets has um, captions, Mm. so you can use that. Um, Yeah, but um, 
it was a challenge. You know, you could start recording and go, oh no, the camera angle's not right. I need you to move. Oh, we can't stop because, you know, yeah, they can't hear you because they're right. doing the camera. You know what I mean? Like, wow. Yeah. What it an was interesting. I, I mean, I've never thought about how that would translate over, you know, COVID times and shooting things on Zoom and whatnot. What yeah. an interesting challenge. Yeah, it was it was so rewarding. I mean, I've directed, uh, you know, musicals and things like that, you know, with a big cast of 35. And um, so it's not like it's brand new for me. But uh, yeah, it was it was a challenge. But I have two awards over there. Best COVID Hell short. Yeah, you do. Best director. yeah, I was like, oh, my gosh, who would have thought I would have done something new and different during COVID. COVID was a blessing for me in, in a lot of ways. Um, it helped me to slow down. It helped me to reevaluate yep. what was important in life. Mm -hmm. And it helped me to realize that I was more than I'm multi-talented and I'm not just an actor, but I'm a director, I'm a producer. Um, and when you're so I, caught yeah. up, yeah, when you're so caught up, you don't realize, um, that you're that you have more more skills than you know and and mm -hmm. you have to trust and believe in yourself. I think it I think it really did open a lot of especially artists and creatives. I think it really did force us to to do that because when you're in this industry and you're just constantly going and you're on auditions and you're doing this and then you're on set and then you're going back and then you're flying mm -hmm. and you're doing all it's it's nonstop. Yes. And so when I remember when COVID first hit and like everything shut down like all of the stuff shut down and everyone was just like what do you mean there's what do you mean huh like there's nothing filming there's no audition what are you talking about I mean it's never happened so for it yeah. to happen you're just like oh and then it like forced us to sit in that stillness and like reevaluate what we want out of the career what we want out of our life if we want to be able to have a better work-life balance, like what exactly it was that we needed. And I think for a lot of people in this industry, it was like, it was a total blessing to be able to just have that almost like exhale. It really was. Um, and it also made me, I had to think, you know, I had to think out of the box. You, in this business, you have to learn how to be multi-talented. You have to learn how to have multiple stream, streams of income. Mm -hmm. and I, you know, it freaked me out because I make my living off of acting. You know what I mean? I was like, oh, I don't have anything. And so once I figured out, okay, well, who is still working? So when I figured that out, I built that right there. Yes, the video. VO box. Hello. <laughs> So I started doing VO, you know what I mean? Now I already do it anyway, because I do, I do something called looping. Um, and, but I started, I started taking classes. I started learning how to do um, radio and commercials mm -hmm. and animation. And, you know, I was like, oh yeah, well, Christy Ferris is going to keep working. I'm going to Pivot, hustle pivot, it. pivot, pivot. No. <laughs> no um. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, brilliant, brilliant move. I I could literally talk to you for hours. I feel like you are like the fountain of knowledge um, that I've needed, <laughs> but uh, uh, I will let you go. But I thank you so much for being on the show. Is there anything else that you'd like to add in there? Anything coming up that you'd like to plug? Uh, well, I am creating a social conscious show, um, bringing people from all different walks of life to have an open conversation about different subjects that can be a little tabooish. So Ooh. I'm really looking forward to that. That will be my next, uh, my next little thing. And then I'm also, since we're on the acting, uh, this is interview for actors. Um, I am creating a website specifically for actors to help them with auditions, which oh. I will um, show and explain uh, a little later when things come out. So we will look for that. I would say more towards the end of this year. Heck yeah. yeah. Maybe we'll have you back on so you can talk all about it. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much. I was such a, such a pleasure talking to you. And again, I feel like I just like went to a masterclass. It was, it was really nice. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope I'm a blessing to as many people as I can possibly be. Oh my God. That's so sweet. I'm going to go cry now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> have a beautiful day. Thank you. 
Look, I don't know about y'all, but I feel like I just went to a master class um, on the business of acting. Uh, that was amazing. Thank you, Christy, so much. I am so excited to hear about this new series and your new business and everything that you're doing. Um, just so, so freaking cool. Uh <laughs> What a badass. I love badass women. Thank you, Christy. Um, if you haven't subscribed to the podcast, what are you doing? You're listening to it right now. You should just hit that, you know, subscribe button and leave us some love, some ratings, some reviews, some stars, all that kind of stuff. Uh, tell your friends, your family, Big Bird. I don't know why I just said that. I'm looking at a picture of him. Um, and that's it, folks. I'll see you next week. As always, thanks for coming in. Contained herein are the heresies of Radolf Burntwine, erstwhile monk turned traveling medical investigator. Join me as I uncover the blasphemous truth of a plague-ridden world, that ours is not a loving God, and we are not its favored children. The Heresies of Radolf Burntwine, coming January 2nd, wherever podcasts are available.